the book is um, about uh, four um, undercover police officers in modern day London who work for the Metropolitan Police um, who um, encounter who, who suddenly get the ability accidentally to see the dark magic and the monsters and then realise that the case they're working on involves some of that and having freaked out decide that they must use these new abilities to use real police methods against the unknown stuff and um, it's given me the opportunity to meet and get to know some really scary undercover police officers. <laughs> <laughs> it's using a real police procedural uh, to do urban fantasy. It's also a little bit science fictional, a little bit sf -nal, in that these being coppers, they take apart what they meet. It's a bit like a traditional science fiction problem-solving story, in that there are no werewolves or um, vampires in the book, but if they were, they would go, so what is a werewolf? How does that work? What does that mean? Uh, and, and they would use the ops board to take it apart. One of my favourite scenes in the book is um, they've realised that there is a ghost bus and that there are ghost ships. And, well, so... This, this ghost ship, has, uh, has this ship lived uh, a, a, a sinful life and has returned from <laughs> having passed off? If we took the um, structure of the ship from the bottom of the Thames and floated it again, we could have that beside the ghost. How does this all work? <laughs> so it's a question of doing that science fictional thing, of taking the magic and sort of working out how it ticks, what, what's behind it, how it all works. The four of them, who are? James Quill... Um, who is the son of Jack Regan from the Sweeney, <laughs> um, and would like to be like his dad, but he's actually a really good modern copper who doesn't really resent all the rules and regulations, but now he's working against the monsters and the black magic, has realised that since none of this is ever going to come to trial, he really can kick doors in and yell, <laughs> you with the tentacles, you're nicked, which is a line from the book. Um, there is uh, Kev Sefton, who is um, the second undercover. Um, undercover is a really, um, the only fast track for black coppers in the Metropolitan Police. So there are two of them in the book, Sefton and Costain. And um, Sefton is a gay black copper which uh, he's sort of out with a lot of people he knows, but this is not a big thing. Uh, he, not a lot of people know this. And at the start of the book, my four heroes really are at odds with each other, are in the midst of a failing investigation. The book is about the four of them coming together as a unit, so he doesn't really trust the people he's with. He's the one who cottons on to the magic. And magic is a word that I don't use in this book. I determine the fact it's going to be like mafia in the book The Godfather. That M word is never used, so I've got the M word, magic, because it would be too easy. Um, then there's um, Costain, um, Tony Costain, who is uh, a bastard. I wanted, to do, I wanted to do a genuinely corrupt copper, and he is. Um, and, uh, but he's our bastard, and sometimes you need a bastard. And this lot realise, actually, they're up against such terrifying things, and they can't talk to anybody else about it, so having a bastard is really kind of handy. Um, our heroes have the, um, the sight, the ability to see the dark stuff. And um, Kev, who's been researching this, has decided to take them on a ghost tour of London to show them it's really not so bad. <laughs> and that a lot of this stuff is just people walking around with their heads under their arms <laughs> and they can laugh at it. <clears throat> so, he said to Sefton, you knew that ghosts were real and you led us to the most haunted building <laughs> in London. What's up with that? <laughs> I didn't, I don't think it's... What Costain didn't like most of all was that Sefton seemed completely wrong-footed by this now. Whatever he'd expected to happen, this was a long way from it. There was a low noise from, it, from the circle, a static hiss that was slowly rising in pitch. I think the circle's melting, said Ross. Do you think it's melting? <laughs> Experiment over, said Quill. Can you get us out of here? Sefton seemed to panic for a second, then he bent to the ground. OK, he said, I'm going to draw a circle intercepting <coughs> this one, and then another, and then we'll slowly head towards the door, and then he shouted and leapt back. The pen rolled into the dark and was lost. He held up his hands, and Costine could see the burns on the tips of his finger. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't expect this. What was the plan? said Pearl. His voice had become very precise. All pretense had left him. That chilled Costain too. I thought 
it would be hard to take, a lot more than the tourist ghost, because that's what all the books said about it, that there's a terrible sense of fear, but the most important thing about this place is, it's not true. What? It's like that bus that had never crashed, like one of Ross's ghost ships that actually sank in the bloody Mediterranean. I followed everything back. I looked up all the details. This place is just a lot of people making up stories, all of them based on what the last one said, and some of them are actually, you know, fiction. Um, from 1871, there was one about a maid having had a fit here. Um, all sorts of stories. A rich man kept this place empty so he could visit, lock up the caretakers and do something evil. Or this was a, where a lunatic brother was kept, fed through a hole, and none of it, none of this shit is true. The most haunted house in London doesn't present a single item of evidence. He sounded like he was arguing with the darkness himself. And there's no proof anyone ever made a sacrifice here. This, said Ross, is what Losley meant by remembered. Stop believing it's real, said Quill. Wish it away. For a moment, Costain was sure he could. He visualised the darkness as not being there. But he couldn't. None of them could. We didn't believe in it when he came in, he said. If it was as easy as that, we'd be fine. They heard a noise in the darkness. The others all fell silent, and there it was again. A footstep on the stairs. Sometime in the 1870s, said, Sem said Sefton. And this is just a short story from what the 1930s says. There were these these two penniless sailors who'd heard all the previous stories only they were too poor to care and they the footstep again closer now the door they couldn't see would soon open they got in here because it was empty and they stayed the night they lit a fire they fell asleep and one of them woke and he heard another step that's what he heard something on the stairs um of us lot it was just me that knew that so you don't need to know it turns out about this to experience it and it's not about what the people who are there at the time believe you should have told us all this said quill before we entered would that make it made a difference whispered ross the sound of the door opening something stepped slowly towards them it felt huge but not focused in one place it felt like it was all around them costain could feel it trying the air around the circle pushing at it trying his eyes at the same time, trying his skin to <coughs> any way in. Costain's eyes strained to find it in the absolute darkness. It felt like it was all darkness at once. Was this the smiling man? How would, it, how would he react if it was him? Was he coming for him now? As long as the circle isn't broken, said Sefton, we're fine. Believe that, because it's true. We can stand here all night if we have to. Their phone text alerts all went off. They all jumped at the sudden noise. Castain let out a relieved breath. The tension was broken. Whoever that was was from their world, from forms to fill out and warrant cards <coughs> and cups of tea. It was probably the news about the DNA searches they'd been waiting for. It was like a torch they could hold up against the dark, something modern. He took out his phone and defiantly hit the text from an unfamiliar number. He expected to see a proud announcement of success. Hope he could use to hold off this dark, even hold up the screen and yell at it that they were closing in on it. He stared at what the text actually said. Any communication breaks the circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Costain looked down at a sudden noise and the others looked too. The circle had roared into a sudden consuming flame. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the circle evaporated, the darkness rushed in. Costain ran. Behind him he could hear shouting. He didn't make it to the door. And that's kind of the big mm -hmm. scary bit. But, well, I did. <laughs> there's all this occult history of West Ham. It's terrifying. I'm now waiting to see... No, they're back in the Premiership. I'm waiting to see if somebody scores a hat-trick in this. <laughs> um, the, the, one of the last edits to the book I made was that West Ham, against all odds, made it in, back into the Premiership, just as I was doing the last edit of it. So I had special permission from Tor to go back and change all the references to Premiership once. <laughs> um, each book will be a, a case unto itself. It's going to be more like a crime series than a um, fantasy trilogy. But there's lots of backstory that keeps on going through all of them. And um, the second book, which I've just... I'm about to finish. I've just written the word epilogue. <laughs> um, is going to be called, I hope, um, Hell is for Londoners. And the 25 words or less of that one is Jack the Ripper is back and he's only killing rich white men. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's got a celebrity guest star. A real person has volunteered to be in it. 
as themselves, which I think is a bit of a first mm -hmm. for novels. And I'm, I can't say who that is. I'm looking forward <laughs> to, to that. You said earlier that you were from around here. Mm. Uh, so why the fascination with London? A setting? Because it, it, <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> it, it's always been that their big city. It's always been the place I went to and was amazed by. I've kind of got an outsider's joy in it. And now I'm living nearby. I, I have lived in it. But I think it's easier to see from a distance and how strange it is. Especially use of space, the fact that there are all these borders which are invisible within it and um, you know, uh, different areas that are defined purely by stepping over an invisible marker <laughs> and um, the, the way that you know, cricket grounds are just tucked around corners and um, it, it's an extraordinary place. There's so many of us now working in this field. I mean, it, it, me and Ben Aronovich are in that it, tiny Amazon genre of yeah. former Doctor Who writers, urban <laughs> fantasy, <laughs> modern <laughs> London police. I mean, <laughs> we call it Metro Punk. It's got a punk. I like it. That, you mentioned the, the research process. How do you find undercover coppers? They're all Doctor Who fans. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the most extreme stuff in the book is true um, in terms of uh, what's happened to police people and um, you know uh, places they've been and things they've seen. And um, it, it, it's actually urban fantasy that lets you do that. I'm not sure I could have done some of this stuff in a pure police procedural. Thank <laughs> you.